Hello, my name is Chris Kurzik and I'm the Principal Engineer at Athabasca Engineering Solutions, AES for short. And uh, what does AES do? Well, first of all, we provide third-party value evaluations. We provide training and certification. We provide equipment re-rating. Welcome back. We're going to continue with Episode 2, Part 2, Creep Assessment. And in particular, we're going to look at the level one assessment procedures. And then we're going to go and we're going to work on a level one example. And we're going to use ASME FFS part two, which is the example specification of, and there's five examples from what I remember in part 10. We're going to look at the first one. In particular, we're going to or take all that information from that example. And we're going to use table 2.2. This is the very important table found in part two, which is what I call the, the roadmap specificate or, or roadmap part of the document where you organize, you know, and, and provide an analysis of what mechanism applies and then you work from there and then we're going to do an assessment a level one assessment we're going to look at a couple different components and then we're going to look at the assessment we're going to look at the damage charts and make some conclusions and to the, the procedure the methodology so level one assessments there's a type one assessment we're using a single design or single operating condition to creep range and then there's a second type called a type two which is a multiple design uh, changes in the operating conditions or in the creep range i tend to use part two because that way uh, like for spreadsheets for example so that you know one is not much different than two and then type three is where you're doing an analysis uh, with the end goal of derating the equipment this presentation will focus on level one type two which is the multiple case co uh, component and the number of, there's a number of steps. The first step is to determine the maximum operating conditions. And there's a special case we'll talk about later where we add 14 degrees if, if it's applicable. Next, next, we'll determine the nominal stress for each component using the, the annexes found in API 579. Then we will look at the damage curves once we've established the stresses for each component and they ref you refer to 10 figures 10 3 to 1026 and then uh, step four we determine the maximum operational periods from these damage cures five and six of the level one assessments determining the creep damage rate which is done by the curves and next step is the final step is to make a conclusion whether this is a pass or fail situation okay now we're going to ready to start a specific level one example we have a liquid knockout drum like shown here and the purpose is to to separate the liquid from the uh, the vapor so that there's no carryover downstream and but uh, the example is that there was recent upset condition where high temperature liquid was relieved into the vessel for a period of time and was subject to uh, the temperatures in the creep range so the uh, we're going to go through this example and we're going to you know break this out using table 2.2 and the vessel contains a seam and the vessel was constructed to, to ASME boiler pressure vessel code section 8 division 1. Our goal is to estimate the level of creep damage sustained by the vessel during the upset condition. I-579 has a large number of components uh, available for pressure vessels all summarized in their annexes. In, um, 
in the in the earlier versions they were all contained in Annex A, and in the last version in 2016 they were they've been split up a bit more. But essentially they're they're pretty close. Uh, we always advise that you go back to the original uh, pressure vessel codes just to make sure you fully understand all the issues uh, because it's kind of a, a Coles Notes version. Very handy though. So basically um, there's a section on internal and external pressure vessel components and there's cylindrical shell uh, quick equations, semi, uh, you know, spherical, semi elliptical type head type situations, torsional heads, conical shells, toroconical heads. Um, we have conical transitions. We have uh, nozzle connections and shells and junction reinforcements. Uh, these ones, the bottom two, are very, very uh, involved. Uh, but in our presentation, we are looking at these two, the, the cylindrical and, and, and the heads that are typically found in industry. Okay, we're going to go and go back to part two, which is the roadmap part of, of API. In particular, 2.2, it's sort of a way to organize, um, and it's a very important part of providing a report, making sure that you've identified all of the the, um, the components. So we're going to go use our example one as a means of going through this. So the first thing is we've identified the vessel as a liquid knockout, knockout drum. It's a pressure vessel. It's a ASME Section 8 Division 1 post specification. Materials of construction are um, is a SA516 grade 70. Uh, our temperatures are shown, given, and then we go through here, and then we are looking at a part 10. There's no other other types of flaws in this example, so we are pretty much ready to go. Uh, the temperature process events. Repair history and the operations history. There hasn't been any in the past. It's the first time. And this is where we talk about the business plan about how long this unit will be, be operated. And in this case, the plan is to operate it to 2026. When, when I, we do our analysis, we also include uh, another table and it's part of the sketches just to keep all the information kind of straight. Uh, for a level one assessment, you don't really need a lot of information for an input, but um, you know this is sort of regurgitated from the last table. For example, the, you know, the, the codes are, are essential to know uh, the materials uh, because it, you'll find later that it'll ref the materials are key with looking at the damage tables. The heat treatment, uh, not quite yet, but the another big factor is uh, the well joint efficiency, and and this is mentioned in the code. So uh, it, it's a factor of the level of inspection, and you know uh, that so it's an option for designers. Of course, things like the inside diameter, and and, and also the wall thickness as well is a factor. And uh, unsupported length, in this case, we don't, we're not using it. Uh, future corrosion allowance is used. The design thickness is, we, we calculate that and we put that into here. And it's it's basically a function of of the uh, the nominal thickness minus the uh, the, f the future uh, corrosion allowance, and then we look at the extrusion properties, which are shown here. So you know the date of the excursion, the pressure, the temperature, the time in hours, and then we look at these conditions as well. 
and study those, include those in the calculation. And that's about it for this. So let's jump to the next step, which is where we look at each components. We're going to look at the first component, which is the cylindrical shell. And we're going to pick a few components. Uh, in this video, we don't Due to lack of time, we'll work on the, the, sh the cylindrical shell calculation quickly and then we'll look at the, the bottom head. And uh, that's used in the API calculation. Now, we're also going to be using the Annex and be aware that in 2007 and maybe 2000 version, the uh, which is the first and the second edition, they had it all in Annex A and then later, when they did the 2016 version, they they moved those sections around a bit, but um, there are some small differences, and you have to use the the red line markup to to make sure that you're currently updated. So um, going back to this adjusted temperature, uh, because our component contains a well that is loaded in the direction of stress, we're going to apply this factor. So I got to go back to here. And then we're going to go and add our dimensional stuff from our dimensional information from our sketches. So we've got our thicknesses and if there are any mechanical supplemental loads, they, they have a little trick for, for looking at loads like piping loads on the equipment that affect it. And they, they work it in terms of thickness, which is very clever uh, in a, in a way to, um, you know, simplify the calculation because this calculation is set up in a way that it's intended to be, you know, relatively quick and painless to do the, to do the math. So, for example, they, they do the, 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 our, the radius calculation here, and then they go ahead and they calculate the cylindrical uh, shell stresses. And there's two calculations that are available. Um, typically, um, you know, if you're in a hurry, just take the largest of the two. You're going to find, uh, in most cases, that they are almost identical. And so, um, the, the the difference is there's conditions. When you do the level two, it has to do with the pressure, and and the weld efficiency, and there's and there's some there's some other factors, and that will differentiate it. But in this particular example. Uh, when you're doing a ballpark type of analysis to see where you are, um, you're fine because the numbers aren't that much different. And this is the same condition over here when you do the longitudinal, that's the circumferential again. You can see there's not much difference, but there can be. And then you basically, at the end of the day, you, you take these both circumferential longitudinal stresses, as you can see there, and you combine them. And that's all there is to the cylindrical. The last component, or the second component we will analyze, is the 2 by 1 elliptical head. And typically, you'd want to take the bottom head, where, the, where you would include the hydraulic pressure. And so the, the fundamental information for a level 1 is all the same. You know, your corrosion allowance, your dimensions. But there's a slight difference here. You, you've got you've got to calculate TC, and then there's a different dimension uh, dimension calculation for the diameter. And in this case, because it's a two to one elliptical head, it's a, um, a two to one, and that's the most common one, at least in North America, that I've seen. I'm not sure about Europe because I I, I don't do work there very often, but uh, another one is you know, there's a couple variations in in uh, table 2c part 33 of the 2016 edition they have a couple different ways to do it and you have to read through it if you want to do a more in-depth analysis level two um, but when you're doing something like a rough scale of where you are you're going to find that there's not much difference in these two values so you know, is it worth it at this point to do a detailed analysis? Probably not, especially towards the end of the video. You can see, you know, how it's the, it's the it's level one's intended just for a very quick 
a, a calculation for for a busy busy person right who's got to cover a lot of territory so here we go so we basically feed use that equation there's only one one equation available and we use this value and we continue the damage chart because we know the materials is SA516 grade 60 it follows under the criteria of carbon steel so we choose we chose uh, figure 10.3 we calculated earlier that the maximum stress was 9 KS, KSI and that the um, the operating temperature was 9 975 so we continue across with that and we determine that the lifespan or the remaining life is somewhere between 25 and 250 hours because we were operating at only 20 hours of operation we're good now let's look at the second part of the damage curve which is the the stress on the on the left column and along the bottom is the damage rate so in this case we calculated like before 9 ksi of stress approximately and we had 975 on one of those curves that we see on the side the slope curves and i've drawn it in blue and then we simply run across and down and then we get the damage rate the last step is the conclusions of the report or the study first of all we from figure 10.3 which is the damage curves the that we have an acceptable creep life for the head and shell components at 975 degrees which included that that extra allowance because of the direction of the stress on the welds and that um, it, the unit could be operated for somewhere between 225 and 2500 hours without an issue and we knew that there was only 20 hours of operation so there's no need for further evaluation but bear in mind that this study has to be included in any other deviations to the process as part of the history operating history of the equipment I hope that you found this presentation useful and valuable to you. This was provided by Athabasca Engineering Solutions. We'd love to hear your feedback and, and your thoughts on further videos. And we'd love to hear from you. Maybe we can do some business. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing. Take care for now.